All right, so here we are again on another episode of World the Hustle podcast. Um, today, folks, I've got a guest on that I have been wanting to get on since long before this podcast was ever even thought about. I've been very blessed with the opportunity today to talk to Dr. Mario Rojas. So, Dr. Rojas, thank you so much for coming on. It, it really means a lot. Ryan, thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so today, Dr. Rojas, uh, I know you told me to call you Mario, but um, it's going to be a little tough for me, so I'm actually going to correct that, Mario. <laughs> um, today, I want to just talk to you a little bit about your journey as a doctor, um, you know, going from the very beginning uh, all the way, you know, how you started, what made you kind of decide to get into that all the way to now. Um, and I've got some specific questions that that I want to ask um, that sort of the purpose behind this is just for us to have a, com a conversation about um, obviously that journey, anybody that's thinking about going down that same path, mm -hmm. um, but also want to get your take on some, some possible uh, controversial issues. Um, and like I mentioned before, um, you know, we don't have to get, we can go as deep as, as, uh, as you're comfortable with, um, but yeah, that's kind of the that's kind of the the agenda today. Does that sound good? That sounds good. Awesome. Um, so I'll just start by saying, um, you know, I know you are uh, a you're an MD, and you're a prenatal, primarily prenatal. You have to forgive me. I don't know much uh, about the medical industry or medical field at all, um, but I know you're a prenatal doctor, right? Well, uh, I'm a pediatrician. Okay. As general practitioner and then pediatrician and then I specialized in perinatal neonatal medicine so what's happening with the baby just before the baby's born at the time of birth mm -hmm. and and then after the time of birth okay so when you say just before the baby's born is that like seven to nine months or something like that well it, it varies because some babies are going to be born term when they're 40 weeks but there are other babies that are born premature and babies that are born before 37 weeks gestation. And so we, when we have premature babies, we go all the way back to like 22 weeks gestation, and we take care of those babies that are born severely premature or bigger babies that are born with uh, congenital uh, problems, lung disease, and so that's the area. Intensive care for sick babies is, is a good summary of that. Gotcha, gotcha. And just, just for my own personal knowledge, um, what's the normal gestation period for a baby? 40 weeks is what we would call term. Some would say, well, from 38 weeks to 40, 41 weeks. Mm -hmm. After 41 weeks, it's called post-term. And um, before 38 weeks, preterm. But there's a big range in what preterm is because you go from 38 weeks all the way to 22 weeks. It's a big, totally different patient's much more complicated, the more immature and, and, and then, uh, earlier they are. Gotcha. In gestation. So before that 38 week, week mark, not to get too technical, but is that when it's like more dangerous for a child to be born or? Yes. Yes. But basically because they're not prepared to come out of the uterus yet. Uh, you know, there, there's a reason for us to spend nine months inside the uterus before we come out. We were supposed to come out mature. Mm -hmm. to be able to survive in the environment that we have. And so it's abnormal for babies to come out before they are mature. Yeah. And uh, if it were not for the technology that we have, of course, the babies would not survive. And this usually happened before 1960s. In the 1960s, there was no specialty in, 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 in newborns and in taking care of premature babies. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of these babies that were born, and one of those babies was the John F. Kennedy baby that um, I think he was born in 1963, and that little child was 32 weeks, and he died from respiratory failure because his lungs were too immature. Okay, so you're telling me that basically previous to the 1960s, it was really hard for a child to survive if they were premature. Right. Wow. And so the technology today has made it to where they can actually live. Yes. Is it, um, and it, actually this is really interesting. So um, what are the main issues that you see with premature babies? So one of the things, because they are so immature, um, 
we have a substance that, that coats the inner part of the air sacs, mm -hmm. and it's called surfactant. And a lot of people don't know about that, but that substance is very important because when it's there and you take your first breaths, then you bring the air in. And when you breathe out, when the baby breathes out, breathes out the, the air sac doesn't collapse. Because when, when it's not present, it does collapse. And when it collapses, it's harder to open up. So you have to put more pressure in the lung to open them up. And so when babies are premature, they tend to have this deficiency of that substance that coats the inner part of this air sacs that's called surfactant. Gotcha. And that starts producing at 26 weeks and it increases uh, as gestation goes on. Yeah. And so for it, the more premature, if you take a baby that's less than 26 weeks, they don't have it at all. Yeah. And so those babies have much more difficulty with that. But there are also diseases that they, they can have infections before they're born and have pneumonias. Um, some of the babies, when they come out, they, the, the way they're, the, the blood flow to the lungs and, and to the heart functions, it's different from what it is when the baby comes out. But some babies don't transition well and they keep performing like they were inside the uterus hooked up to a placenta when they're not yeah. anymore hooked to the placenta and they're out breathing on their own and they can't do it. And so um, that is what we're there to be able to identify those problems and help those babies out during that transition period. Gotcha. Um, and again, I, I hate to go, I hate to go off topic, but I'm now you've got me really deep into this. Do they end up later down the road having uh, issues? If like, let's say a, a child was born premature, does it affect them at, you know, down the road in their life? Sure. There, there are things that can happen with them. Usually the respiratory issues, if, uh, the more premature it is, the longer it takes to resolve them. And the treatments that we give babies, and that's something that people don't talk uh, about a lot. Uh, but the reality in medicine, any treatment that you have is a double-edged sword. What does that mean? It means that it cuts on both sides. Mm -hmm. And so the art in medicine is to try to choose the side that bleeds the least. Yeah. But you can have that with any medication. You use it, it helps you, but it has side effects that will hurt you. And if you give more than the doses that you're supposed to do to solve the problem, you start hurting the, per the patient with the medication. Gotcha. You can't, there's nothing, there's no intervention that doesn't have that. Yeah. And so oxygen, which is something that we breathe 21% oxygen, it's, it's good for our environment, but if we give it excessively, uh, we proved in the 1950s that when we used to give babies, put them like on 70% oxygen, babies went blind because there was inflammation in the retinas. Yeah. And, and from that inflammation, there were new vessels that formed that basically detached the retina. Gotcha. And so there was a whole epidemic of blind children in between 1950s and the early 1960s, and nobody knew what it was about. And it was because we thought that oxygen was a great thing in whatever quantity, give yeah. it. Yeah. We didn't know, we didn't understand this issue about the double-edged sword. Yeah. Because in our mind, physicians, they've trained us that uh, do no harm. That's like the famous words around the physician, but when the physician has experience, mm -hmm. they know that that's not true. That you, you will always have to keep a balance between, yes, the effects of the ones that you want, yeah. but then at the same time, as you're getting the good effects, the bad effects start to appear. Mm -hmm. And that was the, it helped the babies to survive, but many of those babies, because of the excess oxygen, aside from losing their vision, yeah, that affects them long term, they also... Uh, we're having fibrosis in the lungs because of the excessive amount of oxygen. Yeah. It, it oxidizes the, 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 the lungs. It creates what we call oxygen radicals that, that produce inflammation in the lungs. And, um, and then we know that it also can produce damage to the cells of the brain. Okay. And so, um, yes, almost everything... You know, keeping the babies alive, the more premature they are, the higher the risk that they're going to have long-term complications. And so just to give you an example, um, babies below 24 weeks 
on average have more than 70% probability mm. of having severe uh, neurodevelopment impairment. Gotcha. Basically translated mental retardation, yeah. cerebral palsy, cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. as a complication of being so premature. Because yeah. they can easily bleed in the brain because the little vessels are very weak, not very well developed. And so anything can make them bleed inside you know, the, the brain and the spaces that are in the brain. And so all those are the complications that we tried to avoid. And, and we've been successful trying to help babies when they're 25 weeks and above, but we've not been very good with babies less than 25 weeks. Okay. Um, would you say for, for the audience, um, is there anything that people can do to avoid the, is it like, is there anything that causes that you would say causes that or something people can do to avoid having premature births or? Yeah, that's one of the most difficult questions because the right answer to how do you resolve that? It's not really with technology. Really the, the best way to do it is to prevent premature birth. But premature birth is one of those uh, problems that are multifactorial. Mm -hmm. There are many causes yeah. to them. Uh, for some, it has to do uh, with stress during pregnancy. Uh, for others, have to do with complications that the mother develops. Like some mothers develop high blood pressures that they can't control. And so that they have to deliver the baby earlier because there's risk of the mom not surviving and having complications. Gotcha. So the baby, they, they, she might have a 26 week gestation, but they have to stop that gestation because she's not responding to medications. Mm. And so then a premature baby is born for that specific reason. Um, then you have to try to figure out why these mothers have this blood pressure. And that's another complication. Yeah. It's called preeclampsia. How do you prevent that? You know, because there's no history. Some do have history in the family, but those are complications that can occur. And many reasons why babies are born premature. It's not just one, you know, single reason. But nature had it very clear. You know, um, 500 million years ago, placentas appeared for the first time. And we've done some research in that area looking at what's was happening in the environment and of course during those periods of time the oxygen levels on our planet were increasing progressively and but we had swings up and downs and at one point in time we had excessive amount of oxygen it was like 35 percent right now it's 21 percent but it went up to 35 and i believe that as a protection uh, this uh, system of having a placenta because before almost every being that was there was egg being born through egg mm -hmm. but then that didn't become the the best way to do it and we think that there was changes stresses from the environment that then let them know don't deliver them before they're ma mature because when they come out of the egg they're immature for a long period of time and, and there's a lot of eff effects from the environment yeah but uh because of those changing really uh, harsh changes in the environment we believe that at one point then nature and evolution made it so that these fetuses would stay longer. Yeah. And when they came out more mature, their lungs more mature to be able to adapt to this new environment. Gotcha. We never we, we started off with 0% oxygen 3.5 billion years ago. It took 3.5 billion years to get to the atmosphere that we have at this point in time with 21%. Yeah. And 21% is excess amount of oxygen. Oxygen at the beginning was very toxic to all living organisms. And so we had to, through evolution, adapt to be able to live in that environment. Gotcha. Yeah. Wow, that is, that's extremely interesting. Um, okay. Well, thank you for answering all that. I have, through my question, derailed us a little bit, but that was so good. Um, okay, so going back. Now, I know you have been a doctor for like 30 years. From I, I researched you a little bit, just FYI, but you've okay. been a doctor for 30 years. You've been all over the country from what I've seen. You've been uh, to some of the top place, top uh, hospitals. I saw Vanderbilt, Wake Forest, Miami, um, North Carolina. Can you just um, – well, I'm sorry. I'm jumping ahead. 
I, I got a little excited, but can you tell us first, what kind of made you want to get into this profession mm-hmm. originally? It's very interesting because it's, it's, you know, you always expect that you're the one that chooses your profession, but that sometimes life chooses the profession for you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not the way it should be, you know, but yeah. that's how it always turns out to be. Yeah. Uh, because when I, when I, 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 I decided that I wanted to be a physician when I was like 17 or 18, close to 18, we were close to finishing high school. Yeah. And uh, I had a couple of friends that wanted to go into medicine, so I explored it. Um, my father was uh, a person that was very focused in engineering and mechanics, and um, I, I, I worked sometimes with him, but I felt that I wanted to do something similar, but I prefer to do it with humans. I love the human interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I decided that I would go and study medicine. Um, and, and when I went into it, it was, for me, I didn't have anything specific that I wanted to focus myself. Because I just want to be able to take care of patients. And um, I was, uh, I trained in Colombia mm-hmm. as a physician. And then after six years of training there, you have to go into the communities and work for a year in a poor rural, rural or, or uh, poor urban community. Mm-hmm. I went to a rural area of Colombia that was very, very complicated because it was one of those zones. Uh, I didn't have the faintest idea that it was going to be like that, but it was where it was the beginning of the marijuana boom. Yeah. And this area where is where the farmers um, were cultivating marijuana, and so it was the beginning of drug trafficking in the. It, 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 this was 1980 when I went to this site, so mm-hmm. it had started before, like six years before in that region, but um, th- I was a physician in a local hospital that basically was a mash hospital, and so uh, in that area there were left wing guerrilla groups. There was the, the initiation of the marijuana drug traffic, and of course the military were present. So mm-hmm. always a lot of conflict and as the physician there the year I, I, I went there as an intern for six months and then I, I was a medical director there mm-hmm. for another year 18 months and a, lo- a lot of conflict a lot of uh, military problems and emergencies taking care of all these people in, in a very crazy environment very difficult but we, mm-hmm. we sort of understood because we saw the beginning of the drug traffic trade as it initiated yeah at the, at the off start where I was in the hospital we would go jogging at five in the morning and suddenly a DC3 would just lift off and we just, it's, 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 there's no airports here <laughs> these people would come in at night and uh, they would land with you know whatever gasoline lamps or whatever yeah. they would put on these fields and that's where those DC3s landed is that a helicopter no the DC uh, DC3s are airplanes that they use Okay. In Vietnam and different, you know, it's uh, three engine, I guess, airplanes. Mm. And um, and so they, these people were experts landing at night. And, and so at that time, the farmers were paid t- to cultivate. They were given the seeds that we cultivated and then they would put them on the airplanes and they would be moving in and out. It was, yeah. it was crazy. And this was just like, I mean jogging like 15 minutes from the hospital where we were <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it was surreal but that was the way it was it was crazy yeah it's a crazy time and well. so I, we learned a lot about that those problems but of course a lot of health issues and and so that that part gave me a vision that i didn't ever have in medical school um, and sort of that began the, the social aspects of my interest in that and i always wanted to do public health because i felt that it was very important for me to be able to help communities understanding that there were a lot of communities that needed the support from the government and the public health system because of all the diseases. It was an area where there was falciparum malaria, a lot of deaths from babies to adults dying from falciparum malaria. It's it's the hardest form of malaria. Mm -hmm. Uh, But all the tropical diseases that you can imagine, yellow fever, all all those things we we saw. and so it was enriching. Um, it, we, we learned a lot, but um, not only about t- 
taking care of patients, but also understanding the difficulties of people to move. Some people would have to walk a week to get to the hospital, just to get to the hospital for care. Wow. So then after that, I, I finished that, and then I did my pediatric training. And towards the end of my pediatric training, um, I wanted to do emergency medicine. And there was, uh, one, there was a year that they would give you like subspecialty training. And the, day, the year that I asked for that, they said, no, there's, there's no space available for emergency medicine, but there's a spot in uh, neonatal medicine, which the, is the intensive care of babies. <laughs> And they said, and they said, Mario, you take that. I mean, it's great. You like intensive care. You, you don't have to wait another year. Just do it. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I thought of it because I didn't ever even think that I was ever going to do that. And and I chose that. I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And I got into it. And then from then on, every every job that I got had to, was related to that. Yeah. Being at deliveries, taking care of babies, and and then it all ended up. Uh, I, I came to the United States to uh, do the first neonatal resuscitation training program that they had here. It was the first time, the NRP. And so I came to the University of Miami to do that. And while I was here, I was invited by the director, Dr. Bancalari at the University of Miami to come for three months and you know observe. Mm -hmm. and, and I did that. And at the end of that, they opened up um, a job for somebody who wanted to do research in neonatology, and I got that job. <laughs> so it, it, it was just, it was not my decision <laughs> at all. Yeah. It was, this is what you have to do. Somebody was telling me, this is what you have to do. Yeah. It's not your decision. You just do it and do it. And so I, I went through that whole process and then ended up uh, doing my specialty at Yale neonatology that's where i did my postgraduate training wow and then my first job was at the university of north carolina in, in uh, 1997. wow that's awesome um that brings me to a, a question i want to ask you so you've you've studied you studied in columbia a little bit um and you've also studied in the u.s are there are there differences um that you noticed I think the differences that I noticed uh, were mostly in um, high school education. Mm. For me, it was traumatic to move from the United States to Colombia because um, here, I, you know, we had English. At, at that time, uh, we had gym class every day mm. and we chose like two of our subjects. You know, some of those we had to do, but it was an average six. When I went to uh, Colombia, it was double that, 12. And everybody had to take them. I mean, I couldn't choose anything. Everybody had to take trigonometry, calculus, uh, you know, algebra one, algebra two, and philosophy, psychology, uh, mm -hmm. physics. <laughs> it was like, God, <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> and I remember my philosophy teacher, uh, he would have the exam, you know, after he gave the class, I didn't understand anything he said. Mm -hmm. and, and I was trying to get used to, because my... First language, really, I, I came to the United States when I was from four years old. Uh -huh. And and so for me, really, I don't remember before that time uh, that I spoke Spanish. The only thing that I remember is learning how to speak English yeah. at the beginning when they put me in PS 35 in Queens. I was in, I'm in Queens in, 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 a, in a public school. And... Uh, I remember the teachers were very kind and they helped me through it. And then suddenly I was speaking English and that would, became my first language, really. Gotcha. The one that I understood and spoke. And so when I went back to Colombia at age 13, I didn't understand in, uh, Spanish very well. It was very hard. Yeah. Um, but did you, when you went back, did you pick it up? Like how long did it take you to pick it up? It was hard. It was very, it, it was very hard. But um, because of the friends, it was an all boys school. Mm-hmm. And so I liked soccer at that time. <laughs> so my friends became very quickly because I was part of the soccer team. Yeah. And so uh, I, I picked it up with them pretty quickly. They were all very, very helpful. We still have a, a, a group after 50 years. We're going to have been 50 years since we graduated from high school. And next year, we're going to be celebrating that. But they helped me a lot. And so I was able to get through it. But I remember that the, the priest that gave us philosophy... I said, I can't take this test. I don't understand anything that you've said. 
you know, and he goes, don't worry, Mario, you'll understand it. Just present the exam, everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. I present the exam, and when I get my paper back, zero. And I said, why did you tell me to present, <laughs> to present this test if you were going to put me a zero? I told you I didn't understand anything. And he did that. He laughed. He said, someday you'll understand it. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I, I think that um, it was very challenging. I felt a little disappointed because I felt that in high school here in the United States, I was not being challenged. And I don't know what, where, or how I would move if I would have stayed in the United States. Gotcha. Because um, it, it, I, it, the motivation wasn't there. It wasn't clear. And we changed many schools. So it wasn't very, very, very uh, stimulating when I found out that all these other people were seeing all these other things that people didn't take here. Like mm -hmm. I came back from the United States to the United States in 1971 and I went into a physics class and everybody said, why are you going into physics? That's, you know, only nerds go there. Mm -hmm. And I went into the class and all oh, these guys were brilliant. These guys that were in that class were great. Mm -hmm. And I was learning from them and I said, oh, no, no, this is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the resources that we have in the United States were much greater than what we had in Colombia. Yeah. But there was... Uh, uh, the, the focus on academics and trying to balance because they were all very good at math and my right. class the majority became engineers so it was only like four of us out of 36 that were physicians mm -hmm. the rest math they were great at math and they're all engineers and that's where they moved their careers mm -hmm. and so I, I belong to a difference a smaller group of people that went more towards that humanities that were more interested in that type of, mm -hmm. of, um, of subject. But it was, it was good because we, we learned. We had great teachers in history and in philosophy and psychology and all these other things that sort of helped me have a bigger, a better vision of the world, which I felt that in our high school, mm, I personally wouldn't have had the maturity to have made decisions to take that type of course. Do you understand? Yeah. It, it, it wasn't that they didn't have those resources. They were there. But we sort of, well, I mean, I, as, a, as a kid there, I, I wasn't focused on that. I'm, I'm learning more. On the other side, I had to do it. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, okay. Well, one of the other things I wanted to ask you was, um, since you've been a doctor, what would you say has been like, um, the most challenging aspect of of the of your specific area, or as uh, as a pediatrician, what's been the most challenging aspect of that? For me, the most hands down, the most challenging um, has been healthcare inequality. Healthcare inequality. Okay. Yeah, uh, definitely in, in Colombia. The inequality is basically because, uh, you know, 60% of the population is poor, 1% um, very privileged, there's hardly a middle class, and so usually it's the people that have more resources that get better health care. And uh, since 1993, they began to privatize the health care system. And so they've been closing down the public the public hospitals and not giving them adequate resources because the government is not responsible for health care anymore. It's now part of a private industry of insurance companies. Yeah. And so I went for a sabbatical in, in 2015 and I worked at a public hospital in Bucaramanga, Colombia, in the, the Department of Santander. It's a state. And that public hospital, again, a war hospital, um, and, and it has, you know, you go into the emergency room and there are, you know, 120 people in, in the emergency room all in, in their cots uh, and on ventilators. I mean, it's uh, it, incredible. I mean, th that the people are taken care of with such so many limitations. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, those hospitals where the medications for treating children with leukemia run out, then they don't have medications yeah the, the, the children will die because they can't get the medications to them on time 
And, and so the, the, the inequality there is that you, that hospital is located in a distance where there are three more large hospitals that are private hospitals that have all the resources and all those children that have le leukemia that go to that hospital survive mm -hmm. and do well. While the other ones from the hospital where I was working, they don't survive. Their, their, their mortalities are very high because they don't have continuity in medications. Yeah. And so they don't have a universal health care system. It's, it's very similar to the one that they have here in the United States. Mm -hmm. With the differences and that we don't have, because we don't have a strong middle class, working class population, and this happens the majority of the times in developing countries, uh, then we don't, we don't have a way through a workforce to be able to obtain money to support the people who don't have resources. Gotcha. If you have a strong middle class, working middle class, mm -hmm. and there are uh, taxes that are taken from them to then you know, support their health care systems, uh, but also those that are not within the health care system, then you can finance it. But when you have 60% of the population that have informal jobs, they, they live with what they produce on the same day, but they don't have a set you know, employer yeah. with benefits. So they don't contribute to the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's the situation that we have. And that's basically, um, it, it's a change that occurred in 1993 as a recommendation by the World Bank and the uh, the International Monetary Fund, where they asked them to privatize healthcare and education in developing countries. And I think it's been a failed experiment. We, we, we consider that that's part of what people call a neo neoliberal um, e economics, yeah. a market-centered program, but, but it doesn't function in developing countries. It, ex it creates more inequality. It might function in a country with a strong middle class, working middle class, but not, not in developing countries. That's what we've seen our experience. Gotcha. Um, that makes me want to ask, because healthcare is, is it's like a constant topic. Um, and from, from what I've heard, just particularly within the U.S., you know, people are constantly complaining about the cost of health care going crazy. And, uh, you know, um, I want to ask you, or, you know, around the globe, who would you say has um, the best situation as far as the health care system mm -hmm. in the world? So, so there are different models um, that we look at. Um, clearly, as you mentioned, here in the United States, there's hands down the healthcare, the quality of healthcare in the United States is one of the best in all the world, if not the best. Um, but it's very, very focused towards treating disease. And we're very, very good at that. Yeah. What we're not very good at is at preventing disease. And that's our weakness. Gotcha. And that's why we can't get to you know, when you look at um, the outcomes like infant mortality, maternal mortality, which those are social indicators of, uh, they're health indicators of social well-being. What does that mean? If you start to see that your infant mortality or your maternal mortality rates go up, that means your socioeconomic social status is going down. They don't go up parallel. They, yeah. If one goes up, yes. If, you're, if, if, if your mortality is going up for mothers and children, your social, social status is going down. Yeah. If, if, on the contrary, you're decreasing significantly infant mortality and maternal mortality, your social economic status is going up. Mm -hmm. It's a reflection of that. Gotcha. And so the, the, this was uh, identified by a French uh, statistician um, uh, in, like in the 1800s. And... Um, we follow those. So if you want to look at the lowest infant mortality rates in the world, you start to see which countries have the better care, health care system factually. Gotcha. And so you can say, for example, Canada has one of the lowest, the, one of the lowest infant mortality rates. Mm -hmm. 
in the world. But that's a rich country. But there are poor countries that also have it. And one is Costa Rica. It's very close to Canada. Mm. And there's another country in, in, in South America, Uruguay. They have one of the lowest. And so <clears throat> what's so different about these health? Because I, you go to Europe and you, you find that the very low infant mortality rates in countries like Austria, Sweden, Finland. It's, it's, it's not um, unique to just one country. There are countries that have, are very successful where basically any, the barriers to access to healthcare are, are they, they study them, they identify them, and they take those barriers away. The, they, they do practice universal healthcare in these countries. Okay. That's the difference. Why is it so difficult for us to be able to obtain that level of improvement? One, because we don't pay attention to the public health part of this, but at the same time, uh, as the, the cost of care the burden is placed on the person who consumes healthcare, and so it is you and I that have to, you know, cover the cost if we want to have, if, you know, we allow. Right now, everybody who gets sick goes to an emergency room and are taken care of, and that's fantastic, and that's the way it should be. But for the people who are not insured, it is through what we pay in healthcare that we cover those people that are underserved, that don't have the resources, that don't have access to health care, that don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. That's how we do it. And what's happening is that every time everything gets more expensive because we need to be able to cover it. Uh, hospitals wouldn't survive because there is a lot of people that are people without resources to that end up in our hospitals, in the emergency rooms and are admitted into the hospitals. And when they have these huge, you know, the costs of, of healthcare, the bills that they have, many of them can't pay them. Mm -hmm. And so we are the ones that help pay them. And of course, the insurance companies um, increase the prices even more. Yeah. And we're just going up and up. And I think that that's sort of like a bubble that will at one point create a crisis. And I think that yeah. that's where we're headed if we don't change the system the way we have it financially it's not working gotcha okay so that makes me want to ask a question um this is my opinion and i have some i think loose statistics that might back this up the u.s is in, in particularly in some areas is like our culture is just like unhealthy i mean i, I we have uh, i think like a 40 percent obesity rate um, and did that sound right? Closer? Yes, it's, it's yeah. an epidemic. <laughs> yeah, so and children and adults, it, we were shocked because when it became a child part, mm -hmm. that's when it, I mean, the canary is like in the mind. Yeah, it's children having obesity. It's not that's not acceptable. That tells you that something is really it's already too late. It's something's really bad going yeah. on that we've not figured out. Yeah. Um, so you said we're really good at treating. We're not good at preventing. And I'm, I've been told that obesity, it, it leads to all these other complications if it's not taken care of. Um, obesity is like a lifestyle thing, right? So do you think that, that if we as... Um, I put it this way. So a lot of my friends, they love, they're really big health nuts. They love California because they see that whole culture over there, especially some parts of it as like a really health focused um, segment of our uh, country. And so if more people were like, if, if we focused on that as a society, um, do you think that would be big in helping us to address that poor ability to prevent problem that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that, um, Ryan, that you hit it on the nail, that if we really focused on prevention, mm -hmm. we would decrease disease. Yeah. And so, for example, you know, taking away that component that we had of doing gym class every day during the five days, of the week that was all that we needed to keep young people healthy but we took that away 
Yeah. We don't understand the implications of doing that. What, what was going to be the cause of taking that away, you know, minimizing that. E even the, the playtime that the kids have, their recess has been shortened in the schools. So the, the kids are not playing. And we're living in now in a society where uh, kids are hooked on, uh, you know, electronic devices, the internet and games. And so these kids are not playing. It wasn't in our time, we see all these kids playing outside football, baseball. That's what we, we were out there playing all the time. Going, coming home was to coming to sleep, eat and sleep, but the rest was play on the weekends. You know? And after school, yes, after our homework, we were out there playing. That's really disappeared. And, it, and it's, it's shocking to go to the different neighborhoods and not see children. Mm -hmm. They're in their homes. So they've become more sedentary. Yeah. And, and the lifestyle is very different to what we had in the past, and we were having an epidemic. And the other part is that as the cost of life increases with inflation, the people's resources are limited. And so people go for what's easier to pay, so people will move to, towards fast food. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, even in times of abundance, there are a lot of uh, children that at their homes basically... They give them pizzas and they give them chips and they give them Coca-Cola, which is full of sugar, and they're stuck on Coca-Cola. And, and, and when they're not eating, they're eating their ice creams. And what are we, without exercise, what are we doing? And so what is very shocking about this to me is that then the, the NICHD, which is the entity that looks at the health of children from a national perspective, they now invest millions of dollars in research to try to figure out how to curb the epidemic of obesity in the country <laughs> when it's, a, it's, it's, it's in the domain of public health and we already know what we're supposed to do with it. <laughs> we don't have to invest millions and millions of dollars to do research on it. We need to put and apply what we know mm -hmm. in public health. But again... As you can see with what happened with COVID, COVID was an example of how a virus caught us with our pants down. Why? Because our public health systems are the weakest, and it's globally been like that. Yeah. Uh, when the first SARS epidemic occurred, uh, there was a student from Taiwan that flied to Toronto. He was sick with SARS, and they had to close down the airport and everything in Toronto. That At that period of time when that occurred, it everybody said okay we need to help every country develop their public health system and we need to have the, everybody communicate and create a system that when they figure out that there is a case in one place they quickly sound the alarm and everybody gets prepared for us yeah. it never happened hmm. it never happened we said we should do it we didn't do it we didn't do it gotcha this and was so, in the early 2000s right yeah gotcha yeah so we got the warning a long time ago yes <laughs> yes Yes. And so we were not prepared. Yeah. We were so unprepared that even people questioned, you know, it was a virus that spread, you know, from person to person, airborne virus. Of course, the mask is a logical, simple thing to do. It's the cheapest thing to do to prevent. Yeah. You didn't even have to stop people from going to work. You just needed everybody to use their mask and to create some, you know, safe space, but have people keep moving and, and and not closing everybody and telling them that they can't go out yeah. we we understood that from a public health perspective we knew that it was a, a virus that was severe but we knew that using hand, you know, the, 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 the mask you decrease the airborne process of the virus until they figure out what do we do in the long term like the vaccine and so again that was an example of public health. When, when Zika, which was a virus that affected uh, Brazil and Colombia, came, our public, because we went to the same system of the U.S., so you know, we, we have managed care, but we don't have public health. The government doesn't really do their job because they don't have, they're not on site to work with the community. To, that, that, it was good before 1991, and it disappeared to 1993. Um, what happened is that virus came in and we didn't even have a program in Colombia to decrease the vector, which is a mosquito that transmits Zika. And so the women were basically told, well, 
use repellents and uh, you know, but not everybody could have access to repellents. There, they, there was nothing. And basically we had an epidemic with children that were being born with microcephaly and all these other complications that are long term because we didn't have a good public health system to prevent that overgrowth of that mosquito that was transmitting this new virus. We, and we've had several viruses because it's not been just that. We've had increase in malaria. We had increase in chikungunya and dengue fever uh, it, it, because our public health system in Colombia is, is bad. But you go to the other countries and it's the same all around the world. I mean, everybody was having problems. Mm -hmm. Only a few countries maybe I would say like South Korea had a more organized public health system. They were able to control the, the problem better. And every, they, everybody quickly aligned with using a mask. And yeah. so for them, it was very different than for other countries. We were questioning if we should use a mask. I mean, from a public health perspective, you would say, oh, no, God, <laughs> not, not the basics here. This is the right. ABC of, of public health. Right. Airborne mask as simple as that. That's why we go to surgery with a mask. Yeah. yeah it was, if you take care of a patient who has a viral infection, you put on a mask. And right. This is what you had to do. What we, everybody knew that. But yeah, but, uh, we were not prepared. Going back to you said South Korea, right? Mm -hmm. My brother was in South Korea right when uh, COVID kicked off, and he was like, "It just wasn't a big problem over there. It was a whole thing where, like, um, you know, if somebody got infected, everybody got a text in the area, and it was like, okay, stay away from right here." And it, so it sounds like what you're saying, like it was much more well managed. Um, I want to the mask thing. I want to touch on the mask thing. I want to go back to COVID. You brought it up. Um, the uh, you know, there, obviously, there's a lot of controversy around the shot. Um, I will say I got the shot, um, and with uh, without uh, not without a lot of criticism from uh, from some folks. But um, I I'll just go ahead and tell you that before I decided to get the shot, I was on uh, I was kind of like on the fence about whether or not I should do it. Um, you know, it was this whole thing. It was balancing this. Uh, well, it's really, really quickly developed. But at the same time, um, the people that are developing are obviously very smart people. It's people around the world that are spending a lot of time focusing on this. Um, also, you know, I've taken a lot of vaccines in my lifetime. Uh, so I was just like, uh, you know what? Even though for me it was like a low risk thing, the emphasis was, you know, and all the news and everything was like, hey, you really – if not for you, for somebody else that could be more at risk, go ahead and get the vaccine. I did it, okay? Um, I What ultimately made me do it was I ended up talking to um, my primary care physician, and he was like, look, it's a no-brainer. You should get it. Um, but a lot of people, even still today, have not gotten vaccinated. We're at over a million people that have now passed away in the U.S., I think, alone is what I saw the other day. I just want to know... Um, what are your thoughts on, on the vaccine and what, what would you say to people that are, you know, that are not sure about this vaccine or really any vaccine? What, what, what would you say to those people? Yeah, I think that it's, it's, first of all, it's very important to respect people's opinions, whether they agree or disagree with you, that they're human beings and it should be respectful. You should not demonize somebody who because they have one, an opinion that is different from one's, especially, especially where, where we've made so many mistakes uh, as, a, as countries, because I'm not, not talking about the United States, I'm talking globally. Mm -hmm. um, and so the responsibility starts from the top. So if you don't have a good public health system, you don't inform people appropriately and you don't present the evidence clearly. And as you remember, even the... Um, the World Health Organization and the CDC re didn't recommend using the mask. They, they came up with something like, we don't know what complications can happen with the mask. And we were saying, what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. We didn't understand that. So people are getting these confusing messages and some people saying. And when the vaccine came out, all the confusion was already part of the problem. It was very fixed into whatever opinion was going to happen. Yeah. It was a setup for disaster. Mm -hmm. This, this again, 
it's like standing at the end of the waterfall to resolve the problem you know it's already the house that's going down the river and into the waterfall you're at the bottom the problem is going to hit you it's going to well that's what happened to us uh, because this is something that you get educated prior to the event that's mm -hmm. how you, pr you you yes we have viruses that can uh, create pandemics we had 1970 17 flu so we know that that is a problem that can happen it happened at that time and it was going to happen and it's going to continue to happen towards yeah. the future so you have to you have to have a strong public health system and that has uh, good education systems and you start preparing and teaching the people about these things when you're in the crisis and you try to teach and you have misinformation then what's the result you have it's uh, dice it's like 50 percent of people will agree with you and 50 will disagree with you yeah. and so it's valid that people were confused the the vaccine uh, we have experience with vaccines and, and and great histories with vaccines um that the we we've been able to curtail diseases with these vaccines and like anything and again to what we said before uh, there are always side effects. There's nothing, again, that we do in health that is not a double-edged sword. It's, this is the same thing. So they do have their, their side effects. <clears throat> and we've learned from some vaccines that have not done well when they've been administered to the population. And we've tried to correct those problems. And it's done through research and observation but yes, we can't say, oh, 100% vaccine is perfect. No, that's a lie. We can't tell people that. No, yeah. we've made mistakes with vaccines. But vaccines um, were, uh, uh, you know, from the beginning, it, it was always a risk when they started to develop the first vaccines. Uh, and, and, and we found that, yes, people had to take those risks. And, and then that's how we figured out vaccines for polio and, you know, for... for um, uh, measles and for all, all the varicella and um, variola, all these difficult diseases. And so we had advancements with the vaccines. So when this virus came out, um, it did coincide with the technology that they were studying before uh, because I knew that they were using that technology to try to figure out a vaccine for Zika. So it wasn't like it was this one day somebody just came up in the middle of that and said, oh, we have this new technology. Let's apply it and get this new vaccine and try to get it out quick. I was skeptic because I do research. I do the clinical trials. That's my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. And those clinical trials usually take two to three years to, to conduct them. They're very complicated to do. Yeah. Um, so I didn't see a, a short term for the vaccines. But I did know, uh, I investigated the technology and we knew that that technology was around prior to that uh, pandemic, uh, seven, six, eight years. Some people talk about 10, but uh, it's hard to tell. But they had started to do some research uh, for new novel vaccines. So it was there. And so when these two labs came out that wanted to do the vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna, um, Moderna for me was concerning because that was the first vaccine that they were going to produce. I had more confidence with the Pfizer because they have a background, a history of, of doing this and, and, and working in this area of, of expertise. Yeah. And so I, I focused my attention on them mostly and then start to see what was happening with the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and then they start to present publications in the Lancet and, and more objective information on on the vaccine and that sort of led me to then agree with the vaccine yeah before that I, I like everybody else with the same concerns you know how quick is it uh, is it safe yeah. are we, those are normal things that you have to do as clinicians and researchers we have to f look at not only that it's efficacious that means that it's effective for what it's going to do protect you from covid but at the same time that it's safe and and when you do those trials of safety and efficacy, you, you might need 3,000, 4,000, you know, people that go into these trials 
where 50% of them get the vaccine and 50% don't get the vaccine. And then you have to look at how many, you know, the mortality in one group and the other. Yeah. If you have much lower with the vaccine that is uh, significantly lower the mortality, then you say the vaccine works. And sometimes you don't have to complete the whole trial because you do what they call an interim analysis. So at the middle of the study, you look and if it's already advantageous to be with the vaccine, you stop the study. Gotcha. It wouldn't be ethical to continue if you already saw that it's efficacious at, at the middle of the study. So it's, it, it was something that had to occur in that in the, in the, and it had to be done. And so we knew it would take time. So in between, what was it that we had? We had you know, cleaning, washing our hands, yeah, using the mask, the, uh, avoiding spaces with a lot of, of people, yeah. the basic simple things of public health, yeah. that those are were, would have been fundamental that if people were educated before that, that this is what we're going to do in case we have an epidemic of, of respiratory virus that people are getting sick because they're having lung disease, we need to do these basic things. If people knew that, people would have done it automatically, even without waiting. I mean, as soon as they heard that there was a viral epidemic, people would have come through. But you can't blame people now uh, because of all the confusion. I, I, you know, at the end, they were like fighting each other. I said, no, no, <laughs> you know, it's not your fault. Yeah. I, I take more responsibility as a public health person uh, and I, I began telling in my hospital where I was in, in California no nurses have to wear masks but in the hospital where I was if a nurse wore a mask at that time they would throw them out of the hospital they were afraid that the masks would uh, run out they would run out of masks wow and then they started to do you know they, it, it, it was it was just the dance of confusion yeah. and uncertainty that, that occurred just because we were not prepared and I hope that it's a hard thing but as you know in life when you really go into the crisis and you suffer mm -hmm. if you don't learn anything from that then you can't blame anybody <laughs> right. we can't have another situation like this like towards the future that we're really not more educated in, in prevention yeah that makes sense um, so do you think that we have learned our lesson I, th I think at this point, uh, because the opinions from our leaderships have been so confusing mm -hmm. and um, it, the, the, the information from a public health sector has not been clear and open, um, I think that, yes, I think people will learn, especially those who have lost loved ones. I mean, that's the maximum level of crisis. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's not only, I mean, we, we lost fam brothers, you know, people that went to a birthday party and, you know, five of the gentlemen that were there were above 50, they died all. I mean, those, of course, those crises teach people, oh, I'll pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're younger, that's another part that in public health, um, you have to take into account that, for example, younger people tend to take more risks. That's part of being an adolescent. If, we're, if we don't take risks, we're not adolescents. What are we, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's, and it's sort of the natural thing. So when, in public health, you have to anticipate that that's going to happen. Yeah. And so you have to do special type of tailored information for that cohort, for that group of young people that looks at that aspect of taking risks. It's also the issue of pregnancy. It's, you know, we are, young people are more risk takers yeah and so that, that young people uh, are having babies unwanted babies in higher rates than adult people yeah and so uh, uh, all, all these topics that they talk about abortion those are all those topics are public health issues just yeah. like the COVID and they can be prevented but they need the right information you need to educate them tell them it's like a person that smokes <clears throat> you, 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 you can't tell, okay, you're going to smoke, okay, you're going to die, and you're going to have cancer, and that's it. I mean, that, that's your problem. You can't educate people like that. I, yeah. There are people that think about it, and they say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to change, but they don't really act on it yeah. and continue to smoke. There are people who say, oh, I'm going to act it. I'm going to stop my first cigarette from the morning. Okay, that's a different person. 
message for that person is different than for the person that just thought of it, about it but continues to smoke the same amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a one that uh, a different message for one that is already saying no. I'm taking steps to I'm going to put a nicotine patch and I'm going to stop my, you know, two of the 15 cigarettes that I smoke a day. And that's that's an even better person that, that different message, yeah, you know, to be able to get them to move faster towards decreasing. The message for the first two groups has to be much more elaborate, more detailed, because you have to get them into that action phase. Yeah, they're in the inaction phase, uh, and, and and so it's not like oh, just stop smoking, and that's all the doctor tells them. It's not good for you. That's not the way you see it from public health. Public health has to take into account uh, human nature. Human nature is and has been the same over 6,000 years of written history. If we were in Mesopotamia and Babylon and, uh, uh, or, or in Egypt at that time, it's the same human being yeah. that we have today with the same nature. Yeah. And so you have to work with that reality to be able to help people move in the, in the right direction. But people move with good information when things are clear, when, when you anticipate. Uh, in crisis, it's it's much more difficult to do all that. Gotcha. Okay, you mentioned something um, in there. It's a little bit controversial. I want to talk to you about mm -hmm. abortion. Okay, a lot of people are um, really just wholly against this. I want to I want to share my opinion very briefly, um, and then I want to get you to educate us on uh, your thoughts and the reality of it. Um, so my thought is that in the little that I know um, is that abortion is something that we should, we should have a place for in our society um, depending on the situation. Um, I think it's a, I think it's, um, you know, particularly if, if there's a rape situation, um, I think that, I personally think that's a no-brainer. Um, I think if there's a situation where, um, you know, I, I'm very close to people that work in uh, the Department um, of Children's Services. Mm -hmm. And so they deal right now with a lot of kids that their life is just terrible. I mean, I hate to say it, but their, their lives are, um, they're in really rough shape. And there, in, in a, a lot of them, uh, the prospects for the future are not great. And, um, you know, I'm probably going to catch some flack for this, but I, I almost wonder if the, dis, if the parents early on when, you know, it's two people that are not ready to have a kid, they're going to end up, this kid's going to end up becoming, or multiple kids sometimes become, uh, you know, in state custody. And their lives are um, just in turmoil, like the whole time, you know, from what I've seen. I can't help but wonder if they, um, if the situation warranted not having a child at that point in time. Now, I don't know a whole lot about abortion, as I said, but all I'm saying, I guess, is I wonder if, if, if they, their lives are so, are so rough at times, I wonder if, it would be a better situation um, if their parents had made a, a different decision um, early on. So anyway, with that said, what are your thoughts on the topic? I think that the most important thing is to take away the taboo of having any discussion over the topic. Mm -hmm. I think that that's as, as intelligent human beings. And again, we're talking about 6,000 years of written history. We should have, the maturity to be able to discuss this as an open subject and um, not as um, a politically correct subject. Yeah. And it and, and, and taking away the moral aspects of it to try to understand more of what happens on the ground and the reality of this problem. Sure. So let me give you an example where my experience began with this. And when I was in that rural year working in that very, very, in the, poor community in a very difficult area. A lot of the women would come to me 
and would ask me after the delivery if I could do a tubal ligation. Have you heard of the tubal ligation? I have not. So, so uh, the fallopian tubes are the ones that um, uh, you know connect the ovarium so that when the sperm comes up the vagina into the uterus, and then it goes through the fallopian tube to the ovary where then it, it's going to uh, form the embryo. Okay. That's just to summarize it. Mm-hmm. Um, it uh, and so uh, the, 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 the intervention is to ligate and cut those fallopian tubes. Mm-hmm. And so the mother doesn't have any more children. Yeah. And so these were very poor women. I mean, talking about significantly poor. And these mothers basically couldn't feed all their children because they didn't have access to birth control. Yeah. And in part, it was because of their poverty they didn't have access. And in another part is because the Catholic religion that's predominant in Colombia prohibited that. Gotcha. And so they were having child after child. They were pregnant every year, basically. And what but people didn't understand is that when, in, in, when you live on what you produce that day, whatever you produce that day, you have to save like fifty percent to be able to buy the resources to if you want to sell pies or whatever f- to survive for your family, you need to have the the resources to produce it and then sell it the following day. What's left is is for bringing food to the house, yeah. and then if you have three members in the house. The father always gets the biggest portion because that's the person that goes out to work. Yeah, and then the mother has to distribute what's left with, between the children. Yeah, and when you start having one and another another baby born, another child born, the the ration starts to decrease. Yeah. And as pediatricians, we would see how they would get. You know, the first year if they were breastfed, they would be nourished, but after the first year, they would start dropping down yeah. and get severely undernourished. Many of those babies had chronic diarrheas, and many of them died undernourished in very bad situations. So these mothers would come to us and say, "Doctor, we need, we need, please ligate my tubes." And, and ha- have you spoken to your husband? Oh no, cannot talk to him. Is that that it's it's a very um, male-driven society, so that is not acceptable yeah. for them. And so they they would ask me privacy as a physician and so it became something between the mother and me as a as a physician and i would honor those concerns of those mothers and mm-hmm. so i began to in my practice to help mothers get their tubal ligations yeah. and because i understood that that's in a country like uh, uh, colombia it's you know we're talking about 60 percent rate of poverty could you imagine the women in that situation under those circumstances. And here we're doing prevention, but tubal ligation is, is, is prohibited in, for example, in Catholic hospitals. Yeah. And so they, they can't get them. And, and, and so they had to recur in, a, in secrecy to the physician to get that procedure done. Yeah. And we're not even talking, this isn't even, we're not even talking about abor- abortion yet. Yeah. So no access, no education, they didn't get educated, sexual education. They didn't have that. Yeah. No resources, no access to birth control. Yes, and then pressure to have, you know, not, not, to, not to get have birth control from a religious perspective and then having unwanted pregnancies. And so it's very important to understand that there's a big difference between an unwanted pregnancy and an unplanned pregnancy. You may have an unplanned pregnancy, but once you know it, you say, "Well, cool, okay, another child. We want another child. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's great." But a different situation is unplanned, uh, unplanned, and unwanted, and then that's a difficult situation because it can vary for different families. And so, I'll give you examples of critical things that usually people don't talk about. Of a situation where we had a baby that was born at 25 weeks gestation. And the father, um, the mother did not want us to give any life-supporting interventions for that baby. 
uh, she was concerned about the poor outcome that baby could have from a mental perspective, and, and it was very valid at that time. Yeah. Talking back in, uh, that was 1994, 1995. And then and the father, on the contrary, opposed the mother, and father said, I want that baby. And so it was a big discussion on the ethical issues between our group, and we said, well, because the mother and father are in disagreement, we then move towards resuscitating the baby. That means giving all the life-saving support to that baby. Okay. That baby survived. And that baby had all the complications of a premature baby. Bleeds on both sides of the brain, uh, severe lung disease. I mean, it was very, very, very difficult. Okay. Like four, five weeks into that, after the baby was born, the father attempted suicide. And then the mother disclosed that that had been a problem even before, you know, for many years. Yeah. And the father was a severe alcoholic. And the mother comes to us and say, you know, you didn't want to listen to me. This was not good for this family to have this baby. If this baby would have survived the environment in this baby was going to be brought into. Yeah. Yes. And that man was not going to give up that son for an adoption. And so it, he, ha he, he was sick. Yeah. They were sick as a family unit. They knew that it wasn't, that it wasn't meant to be. Yeah. So in those cases, it's for people to understand that, you know, it's, it's, it's just keeping babies alive for the fact of keeping babies alive and put up, applying the technology without even any thought process is easy. I can apply the technology. What I need to do as a physician is really to pay attention to the people, to really talk to them, to try to understand really what's going on. And when I don't have a problem, I bring a psychologist to help them figure that out. And I bring in people from ethics to help us make a better decision, yeah. which in those times we didn't have that. We didn't have that. And I'm, 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 I've been implementing in my work trying to get psychologists to be part of these neonatal teams because, you, you know, the parents are depressed. Many of the parents have bipolar. Many of the parents have all these other complicated issues that we don't know about. And we put all the efforts on babies that are on this limit of viability to then go home like I had one that went home and died because the father basically grabbed the baby and shook the baby, shaken baby syndrome. And, yeah. and the baby, and I was like frustrated because the baby was there for three, four months. And after all that work, we give them to the parents and then the child dies yeah. at home from a violent interaction. Right. Something that the parent can't control because the father has a problem. Right. It's not that the father's a bad person, is that they have problems that they can't take care of a child. Right. And that's a great majority of these babies that are being born because the premature babies are born more from communities that are underserved mm -hmm. and have poor resources. So that's the biggest issue from a global perspective is, is this an unwanted pregnancy? One, yeah. do the family have the resources? Because we've had babies, I mean, this is every day. And for any neonatologist that's experienced, he'll say exactly what Mario is saying. That's what happens to us. We spend millions and millions of dollars and we take care of these babies, very, very fragile. And some of them we have to send them home on ventilators, on breathing machines and apparatuses because they can't breathe on their own. And where do they go to? Oh, the parents, they live in a trailer and they can't have the, the electrical systems to be able to have a, a breathing machine in there. Mm. Or, oh, they're homeless. Mm. What do you mean they're homeless? Yes, they live in... They, 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 they go to a homeless shelter to, to sleep. So where, where are we going to? Oh, no. so now we have to look for foster care. And the foster care system uh, is overwhelmed. Mm. It's overwhelmed. Yeah. And so they end up in bad situations and dying in situations that we can't prevent. But I could feel comfortable saying, no, I did my job. I just applied the, the, the technology and we went through the whole thing. And whatever happens after that, that's not my problem. That's not how we understand. We, we understand a fundamental concept that it's all, we're all interdependent. Mm -hmm. That what is happening right now, there's a reason 
we need to understand how that's going to affect the family, how it's going to affect the baby, what is the environment that the baby is, is it appropriate for that baby? And so it's much more complicated. And, and life is harder when you think like that, but it's more important to do that because sometimes you really can help families make the right decisions if you really listen to them. So when you go to the issue of the abortion, that's, that's, that's an issue that's been with us all our humanity. Yes, it's been there all our humanity. It's not something new. We're, if, if, if we're like 2.5 million years old and that skeleton that they found of uh, Lucy, that's that old, like 2.5 million. Well, since Lucy exists, there's abortions. And some are natural because you have spontaneous abortions. Yeah. And the majority of those, the majority of those are because genetically there's a problem and it's nature taking care of the problem. Is this a miscarriage? Yes. Okay. That's the word. Gotcha. Exactly. Okay. Yes. And so when that happened, it's nature saying, oh, you know, genetically this baby has an issue and that baby's not going to survive. This baby has. And wow. so the, the miscarriage, that's what the majority of the miscarriages are about. And so, mm. and so it's nature helping make that decision because it's not sustainable. Yeah. And then the other situations, of course, are what is early preterm labor when mom starts having labor earlier than they're supposed to. And so we, we don't know what's going on with the baby, but we start to study the baby, the ultrasounds, the tests, and we try to use methods to try to keep the baby more time in utero. And sometimes they're successful, but not always, and they're born premature. And so we, we have to do something with the babies. Yeah. Um, so th there are ethical issues there because as you go down in gestational age and you keep a baby alive at 22, 23 weeks, again, the risk of having a handicapped child with poor quality of life and in a situation also <laughs> because they come more from these underserved populations of having a very difficult environment and not surviving, uh, I, I think it's something we, we've not wanted to talk about. Yeah. It's one of those issues like a taboo. It's like we can't deal with it. Let's not talk about it. And, but in society hasn't. <clears throat> they don't talk about it. They don't write about it. They don't want to hear about it. But that's that's the reality. So abortion is one of these issues. So if you ask me, I would say what our function is with the information, with the knowledge, with the technology that we have, we can prevent many, many, many abortions. Mm. But it's prevention it needs good sexual education, has access to health care, yeah. access to all the uh, medications <clears throat> that have been developed through science to prevent the pregnancy. <clears throat> and even medications like the pill after the first day, you've mm -hmm. heard about that? Plan pill. B. Plan B. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's a very early process. It, it occurs very early. You, you stop it at, at its beginning. Gotcha. That you should consider those seriously, and from a public health perspective, we don't we we, we prefer to go that route. Yeah. Than to then wanting to interrupt the pregnancy at twenty four weeks. Right. When a, a little fetus is well formed. Mm -hmm. These are people are saying, well, what we don't accept is that you know you have abortions at 24, 26 weeks, twenty eight weeks, and we're saying. God Almighty, yeah, that's really, like, again, the waterfall. That's like, that child is very well formed and has a good probability of surviving if that baby is born at 20, ab above 25 weeks. Mm -hmm. And if they're talking about a 26-weeker, I say, wait a second. That baby, we have the technology and the knowledge to be able to help that baby and, and, yeah. and with lower rates of complications from, you know, cerebral palsy, mental retardation, these types of neurodevelopmental complications. Mm -hmm. But um, first of all, we, we, from a public health perspective, we have to do these things. And it, I don't know if you know that in, in, in big cities all across the country, all the states, like for example, here in, in Nashville, we have one, some of the best hospitals that you can't imagine. Vanderbilt, Centennial, St. Thomas, all these wonderful hospitals and all the resources and everything. But as you move towards the east of the state, the infant mortality rate starts climbing up. Wow. Yeah. 
and, and, and t not to the east, I'm sorry, <laughs> to the, towards, uh, towards the west. The west is it. Okay. Memphis. Memphis area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then your infant mortality, maternal mortality starts just going up. Wow. So this doesn't happen in Tennessee. You know, if you're in North Carolina and you're in Winston-Salem, there's specific areas there where it's mainly African-American populations mm -hmm. and, the, and the mortality, the maternal mortality yeah. and the infant mortality are three times that of the white population. And, and so what's the problem there? The problem there is segregation and access to health care. Yeah. So what's the solution for that problem? Yes, because those mothers, of course, if they're getting more children and they're financially challenged and, and, and they're opting for abortion for an unwanted pregnancy that they figured out that they had at three weeks or four weeks or five weeks, or six weeks, you know, at after the last menstrual period. Some of them don't even know because they don't have regular menstrual periods. That's why you can't pinpoint it early. Yeah. If you knew exactly that everybody had the same period and that you could count, that yeah. would be great. But here we don't know because there's some that have irregular. Mm -hmm. And so when they figure out, you know, it could be already three months. And what people don't know is that a, 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 an embryo, the fetus is completely formed at three months. Yeah. Before that, it's not viable at all of course it's not well formed when it, it, at three months they're potentially because if they were born at three months they're not viable but they have all the potential to develop normally gotcha and so ideally ideally and i'm talking about an ideal situation which is not the reality at this time mm -hmm. you would like to intervene before it becomes a, a completely developed embryo gotcha Yes. And so before that time, you would want to have that opportunity. And I think that science will lead us towards that. It's already in that path. So but we have tools to be able to prevent. But we can't have good. Even if we had all those tools, if we have bad education. Then it's useless. Yeah. It's, the, it's the same. Like, again, not educated to prevent a, a pandemic of virus. <laughs> in yeah. this situation, we don't. So again, it's not about good and bad, what people tend to gravitate. This is good, this is bad, and this is why I'm taking this, this, I'm, I'm against it, and the other one's in favor. And I see all these people with their, you know, doing, you know, in all these birth, birthing centers or places where they uh, help plan, family planning services and yeah. the billboards saying against, the abortion and all and a lot of them are people who really don't understand the social implications of such a complicated pay. Yeah. They, people don't do it because they want to do it because this is a, something that they enjoy do it no, no woman enjoys this procedure it's 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 for them it's very very difficult yeah usually what happens is you have an adolescent now we're going to talk about <clears throat> people who are not impoverished we're going to move to the middle class mm -hmm. and then we have young <clears throat> adolescents that are, are risk takers like all of us and yes, the science is, is there, but uh, there's something in us <laughs> that we don't think that it's going to happen to us. Oh, no, the car is not going to hit me. I don't need insurance. Right. Yes, I'm going to ride that motorcycle and I'm good. I don't need anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, that's the way they manage sex also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so what are we going to do? We're going to put all our kids in jail. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're punish them. Yeah. 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 And when you punish a mother an adolescent yes that you're going to put her in jail for 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 an abortion are you going to do it to your child are you really an adolescent do you not understand adolescents have you not been an adolescent and i can assure you that many of the people that are that would say yes i'd put them in jail because there are people that are promoting that putting mothers in jail because of an abortion i have not heard about that but okay oh yeah wow. there are states like georgia have them trying to support that that, wow. that yes penalizing abortion wow. so that they go to jail that's where it's going to wow that's where the discussion is going to and we're absolutely against that because we can't we're all we're all humans we all have that human nature we all make mistakes we need to understand this and help us we can work together to prevent Yes. Mm -hmm. And be supportive when 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 somebody has to make that decision. But that's a personal decision between the woman and her physician. Yeah. It shouldn't be a political issue. Yeah. 
our function uh, in, 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 from a society is to assure that whatever decision is made is thoughtful and it, it does protect the, the, the mother, mm -hmm. yes, and that uh, if it's done, it should be safe because my responsibility is not to be judgmental. My responsibility is to be sure that, that that young adolescent, in this case, we're talking about an adolescent, is safe and gets a procedure with the technology that, and the knowledge that we have. Yeah. Not doing that is saying, okay, <clears throat> I'm going to put you in a situation where we're going to give you tools that are instruments to do the intervention that are infected have a high probability of being infected, so you're going to get an infection and you're going to die from the infection. That's not compassion. Compassion is very, very clear. Compassion is putting yourself in the shoes of that person. Yeah. Many of them are afraid what their families are going to do. They're going to throw them out of the house. They're not going to get thrown out of school. They won't be able to finish what they were going to do. They wanted to go to college. They wanted to do things. There's a lot of pressure on women that you know, we in society, we don't recognize yeah. uh, because uh, as males, we're not in that situation. Mm -hmm. You know, what happens? Why is it that women have to be put in jail? What happens with the man who is the father of that baby? Where is the responsibility mm. on their part? Where is it that we as society are saying, oh, no, it's going to be both. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're going to pay both. Well, how are they going to pay? <laughs> well, it's not punishing them. You, you, you want them to be prosperous. And to, yes, we made a mistake. Or how do we correct this? And how yeah. do you, how you guide your children in that process? They're, they are our children. That's the interdependence that we have. Yeah. But we think that putting you in jail is going to be the solution. Yeah, it's, it's, it's absurd. And, and reversing, you know, all these laws that have taken so many, many years to uh, protect the decision of the mother, I think that we need to fine tune it and we need to enhance our education first and our prevention. And, that, and we will see that it significantly decreases. And the rest has to be dealt with with a multidisciplinary team. Yeah. You know, if, if, that, if that woman has access to a multidisciplinary team that, Yes, that will respect her final decision, but will show her different perspectives that uh, she might make a decision not to. That's not bad. That's okay if, if she decides that at the end. Yeah. And it shouldn't be through coercion, which is the issue. You know, coercion is if you don't do this, you know, we're going to do this. You know, we're, we're going to kick you out of school or we're going to put you in jail. That's coercion. Yeah. That's not. That's not. That's us uh, acting as. If we were police, and that's not what we we're supposed to do with our, with our kids. For an adult woman in society, there are other factors that play into account, like the example of that mother that had that 25-weeker mm -hmm. that I told you about. Yeah, it, it, She might have decided earlier that it wasn't right for her to be pregnant, and she might have done it without her husband. And if she went and had an abortion mm -hmm. uh, shortly after knowing that she was pregnant, it most likely would have been in that case specifically in retrospect it would have been the right decision yeah but it was it, it should have been her decision hers it's it's her it's as the mother yeah can i be a good mother to this child or mm -hmm. yeah. and i had another case of another situation where there was a mother that was non-english speaking and was in a very poor situation um financially and single mother and she was you know, they were asking us if we should give resuscitation interventions to her extremely premature baby. And they were asking me to go talk to her to tell her that they were going to do a C-section to have the baby born and get resuscitated. And when I went to talk to her, she said, no, I can't have that child. It's impossible. I don't have the resources. We, we can't even with three because she had a child and her husband and her. We can't survive on our own right now. You, with the 25 weaker, we won't be able to. I mean, it's impossible for us. But they, yeah. there was communication issues. They didn't. They were not listening to her. Fortunately, I was able to. Uh, they asked me to talk to her, so I was able to communicate to the obstetricians that that was not her desire. And yeah. so, it's so complicated. And in each case, is so different that you can't make generalizations. Gotcha. And you can't say. You have to learn that we live in a world where it, it, we live in paradoxes. What does that mean? That something can be good and bad at the same time. That's a paradox. Mm -hmm. 
what's good today can be bad tomorrow. And what's bad today can be the right decision tomorrow. That's, that's how great our world is. Yeah. And so to put this in this political environment where it's good and bad is a pretty, it, for me, it's, 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 for me, it's, it's a oversimplification of something that is socially very complicated. Yeah. And, and it, it is very complicated for the woman that experiences that in a society where there's still inequality between men and women, where men have the advantage. Yeah. And so if those if the men are the ones that are making these laws, uh, they're not they should not be doing that at all. They should be yeah. hands down out, walk away. Just this is not an issue to be resolved in Congress or by politicians. Yeah. That's that's basically my opinion on this. It's a public health issue. Mm -hmm. We know that we can do better with it, and we have the the, the technology and the knowledge. They they asked the Dalai Lama in the eighties. And so what did he? Uh, what was his opinion about birth control? And he, and he basically said, <laughs> "What science has developed will decrease if if it's done well, if you use it well, it, that technology, it'll decrease suffering. So if you can, with that knowledge that you already have, you can decrease unwanted, unplanned pregnancies. Yeah. Now, I'm, and I have to say, always unwanted, because as I mentioned, unplanned can become wanted." Yeah. But unwanted, unplanned pregnancies, if that can prevent that, he goes, how can you not uh, avoid suffering? Yeah. If you take that away, then, and then you say, oh, and then on top of that, you know, crucify that mother because she had an abortion, put her in jail. If you don't give her any education, yes, to be able to prevent it, and how can you ethically and morally <laughs> condemn that person you know who, who throws the first stone <laughs> right it's it's that concept it's the yeah. basic it's really and that's a very nice example of that yeah um mm. that was eye-opening all right sorry about that we're good okay so that was very eye-opening as i said i appreciate that so I want to, there's, there's two things that came to mind. Um, number one, it, it sounds like this decision with this Roe v. Wade thing is critical. Hmm. And another thing I want to say is this, um, as you were talking about just some of your experiences, I was putting myself in your shoes as best I could. And I, I've, I've always kind of known this about, people in the medical field, but particularly doctors, like you guys have to be so mentally, there has to be such mental fortitude. It seems like to deal with some of the stuff that you guys see and go through. Um, it, I just don't think, I think that if that was a path that I wanted to go down, I just don't, I feel like it would be really challenging for me some of the stuff that I know, you know, I'm sure you're not even hitting the tip of the iceberg here of what you told me. Um, is that something like for people that are considering going to the medical field, is that something that you would tell them that they need to understand that there's going to be tough stuff that they're going to face and deal with? I, I think when I, when I talk to the medical students, <clears throat> usually of course they've made their decision that they want to study medicine. And, um, they always ask us to write an essay before going into medical school of why we went into medical school. And I have to read those essays, you know, to, you know, as part of that process. Yeah. But I always find out that we really don't understand why we get into medicine. And that's not only for them, it's for me too. Yeah. I didn't have the faintest idea about all these things, really, that all, all the, the social, the ethical implication. I, I was focused on on the healing part, okay? So there is a problem there because we are focused on, um, on um, taking care of disease and that's the sexy part of mes medicine, making a diagnosis, you know, and, and then coming up with this brilliant diagnosis and then giving the right medication and everything. Um, and that's what all these movies and television are about. They basically are focused on how they treat the disease, the disease, the disease. It would be very boring <laughs> to do a show on television about how do you prevent a disease 
because people who are in public health are people that are very patient and they think and it's, it's, it would be a very slow show. It wouldn't be as dramatic as ER or one of these programs on TV. Yeah. But the, the, the reality is that we, when we go into medicine, uh, we then get into the deepest and most hardest part of society with which is individual suffering mm. and, and and you see the, the 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 suffering of the human being and um and there are different ways that i tell them you know what if you if you if, if you don't understand what's compassion and I tell you that I did not understand that. I intuitively somehow had it in. We have things that are like already hardwired in our DNA. And, and, and if, you, if we took the time to know ourselves better before deciding on a career, you probably would figure out a lot of these things that would tell you, yes, this is the field you should go into, or no, this is not. The field that you should go into, yeah. uh, but we 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 don't really know each ourselves very well uh, when we go into this, and and it's because when you see in the practice, th there are a lot of people that love the technology. They fall in love with the technology. It's like sitting down and you talk with doctors, and they like to talk about their uh, Maseratis, their BMWs, and their the engines, and they. I mean, like. You know, it's medicine and it's cars, and it's one of the most boring places to be because they just talk about cars all the time, <laughs> nothing else. And um, well, they with their breathing machines and all the technology, they, be, they they get that same situation. Curiously, that's something that I've seen in my experience. Hmm. And so they're very good, and not all of them. I was talking about a, a segment of our colleagues where they become excellent technicians excellent technicians nobody can when you were see them work and everything they apply the technology very very well but that's a tiny piece about being a doctor and so in in my time when they we were taught we were always uh, it was emphasized towards that we should not get emotionally involved with what the suffering of the patient yeah because then you would burn out very quickly yeah. and you would affect the patient relationship. And I, I couldn't ever adapt to that. Hmm. I just couldn't do that. Yeah. I couldn't have a five year old with a leukemia who was a, like the cutest kid in the ward who would come up to me and ask me how, you know, to play with them. And I knew that that little child had a, very severe case of leukemia that probably wouldn't survive and um I, with that child sp specifically he was one of my patients as a resident and i still remember his name his name was israel and he was the most beautiful child and um he got he started to get worse and worse and um i had to go to a different rotation in the emergency room after i was there for like three months with him and we bonded a lot. And then they called me back one night because he was basically dying. Yeah. And um, I went up, I stopped my activities and went up to, to, to see him on my break. And I sat in that next to his bed. And, and it came to me, there, a study came to me very interestingly during that period of time of a psychologist that basically gave the babies, the children that were like his age, toys. Mm -hmm. And with different... Um, so he, they gave him a toy of the doctor, they gave him a toy of the nurse, they gave him a toy of the mother, or the father, the brother, and, uh, and they would observe what the child would play with. Yes, and so in, in, in his good times, everybody was around playing with him, and he would play with all the toys and everything. As the time came where the baby was getting, the child was getting sicker and sicker, then he became very selective with the toys. So just prior to the death, then the only toy that was around him was the nurse and the mother. Hmm. Not the father, not the brothers, not the mother and the nurse. 
and the farthest of all the toys that was farthest away yeah the doctor mm. and so i think it has to do with our education i never forget forgot that because i was living it and then i got this information and and i said i understand that mm. and we sort of it's a coping mechanism that as we see that our patients are not responding to the treatment we start backing off yeah emotionally uh, effectively and, and 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 then and sort of to protect ourselves because they've told us not not to do that yeah absurd what you have to do that yes is be closer to that child when that child is dying because that's part of the treatment yeah not it's not the success that you want to be with because everybody loves the success and that's what we all you know oh, this child i survived with what i did that's what they boast about that's the vanity behind it yeah no no when things are not working well then that's when the real doctor should come up and that child that doctor should be close to the family should be close to that child and should be there when the child dies and be comforting that child and not letting that child suffer yeah minimizing the suffering for that child not moving away from the child we don't educate our, our doctors in today 2021 they don't get that education to do that and so we leave our patients alone in, in that and sometimes we defer we've taken care of them oh but like in my case this baby is not is not going to survive tonight the doctors have been taking care of them for two months comes to me and says could, could you just be there when the, when the baby passes and i think to myself <laughs> If you're the doctor that's been t taking care of this baby for three months and has had the family, yeah, you might not get home today mm -hmm. to see your kids, which I know that's valuable. But today, you need to be with this family. You need to be with this family. You're the one that they trust. You're the one that they you've dedicated your time to them. And, 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 and I think it has to do a lot of with that fear of, of, of it's been taught to us that we should not engage and i think that's yeah. a big mistake we we need to help and our heal and to help people our patients survive but when we can't do it because we're not god we need to help them die with dignity we need to be there first of all be present and and you don't have to say anything parents just value tremendously when you we are there i was able to be there with that mother and that nurse and and i wish i could have round up more times before that but that was the situation for little israel and so uh, it, it is something that I, I didn't know that and i've seen people that react totally different to what i did that day and so i learned it um through intuition we, yeah. we we tend not to value that but intuition is very very important and and i think our many other people don't know that it's not about being a technician it's that's that's an important part i'm not saying it's not important mm. uh, but it's also about recognizing that we are all interdependent that those are our children that those are our parents that those those people who are suffering there um, need to feel supported like you and I would feel if, if we felt totally alone in a di very difficult situation and nobody is around us and you just have to deal with the suffering yourself. If you, yeah. somebody comes up to you and so, you know listens to you and you can express yourself, you're, and if you're mad, you can be mad. Whatever you need to do, that's good. That's okay. Yeah. And, and so, but you want to be with your patient. And so I, I think that um, we, we do have to re-educate our doctors I don't think we're doing them a good service because um, we we teach them basically as I said just to focus on disease but we also teach them to become great technicians and with the the, uh, the robotics and everything how medicine is moving we tend to be further away even with the computer yeah. systems that are in our hospitals now we don't even look at the patients it's hard because you have to be on a very complex computer putting in data and so you're not paying attention to the parent yeah all that is negative mm -hmm. it's not good it's we've lost the interaction the eye contact mm -hmm. you know the empathy that the, the, the 
we're losing that yeah. very quickly. Yeah. And we're adapting to uh, an AI environment, the technical environment. And yeah, wonderful, you're great at that. But that's not what's really valuable for the family. I think, do you understand yeah, I that? I totally understand. That's, yeah. uh, that's what I would get through. And I, and I yeah. think that, that, that if we could you know, change the way we are educating the people and then telling them the reality of what they're going to be getting into. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's, if, if you're not willing to give up some of your, your time to be taking care of the patients, um, it's a double-edged sword again because uh, in some programs they abuse the residents um, and so they created very strict times of hours when you're there. But from that well-intentioned effort, we have a negative effect, which is, oh, it's 12 o'clock, I have to go. Uh, yeah, but your patience is getting worse. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, no, they tell me I can only be here until 12 and so goodbye. <laughs> We never did that in the past. Who cares? I stay until I see what happens. with. How can I teach empathy and compassion like that? Mm -hmm. When they tell me, oh no, it's 12 o'clock. And they just walk out. The residents, mm. the interns, they just walk out. Mm. Oh no, I'm only allowed, because if I pass, then I have to tell my boss that you t make me stay more time and then it's going to be your fault. Mm. That's the way it is right now, mm. protecting the hours so that we don't abuse the residents. Well, it's the double-edged sword for protecting them. Now we're abusing the, the, the patients towards the future. Yeah. Because compassion and, and ethics and, uh, are not, uh, and, and empathy are not dosed. <laughs> I can't do it from 8 o'clock to 12. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it brought me to that child at a hour. At, <laughs> it was 3 o'clock in the morning. Right. Yeah, I, I could have gone to sleep mm -hmm. or whatever. No. And so we, we've not figured that out, basically, in medicine. And so I, I, I would have, if I had the opportunity to get people before, I would talk to them about these reality of things. You can't, you can't like have, you, we, we all have biases, right? Mm -hmm. And they've done studies that there's two types of biases, conscious and unconscious bias. The conscious bias, as you say, I don't like black people. Period. I've always said that. Yeah, that's conscious. That's a bias, and that's conscious. The unconscious bias is you tell yourself you don't like black people, and 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 and, and you repress that. Mm -hmm. But when there is a situation, a critical situation, whatever decision you make, mm -hmm. most likely you're going to express your bias towards that person, even if it's unconscious. Gotcha. Hmm? Yeah. And so um, we all have to have had some type of support in trying to uncover our unconscious biases because they affect the lives of patients. Yeah. Because the doctor is not going to give the same quality of attention if there is an unconscious bias. So let me give you an example. They looked at emergency rooms mm -hmm. and they looked at the amount of pain medication that they give children under 10 years of age in emergency rooms. And this, the, the, the children that are African-American get three times less pain medications than the children that are white. Mm. And I'm sure those doctors are not doing that mm -hmm. consciously. Yeah. But there's something there that we need to understand that there, there is a bias there. Yeah. And so big decisions and lives can be affected by those types of unconscious. So I would say to anybody who's going to start medicine, okay, we're going to have somebody analyze your conscious and your unconscious bias. Yeah. Because at least if you uncover the unconscious, you say, oh, oh, I don't like fat people. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you're an internal medicine doctor. Mm -hmm. You're going to have the fat people, and that's going to be a big population because we're in a pandemic. Yeah. And, and so you unconsciously are going to not treat them well. If, 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 if you are a person and you don't like children, internally you're saying, oh, I'm not a good person. How can, all good persons love children, right? <laughs> they take care of one children. They love children. Mm -hmm. But this person doesn't like children. Mm -hmm. And that person says, I'm not a good person. No, 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 no. That's not acceptable. I'm going to prove that I'm a good person. 
Mm. I'm going to become a pediatrician. Mm. And then goes into the practice. Yeah. But doesn't like children. Mm. And so we've seen pediatricians mistreat children. Yeah. And so if, if your pediatrician scared you to death, you know, he, he did something t- or, or pinched you or did something to you when you went to, and then you can't tell your mother or nobody cared why you were crying or anything. Yeah. You might have had one of those pediatricians. <laughs> gotcha. And he's trying to correct something that he feels is not, instead of having somebody work with him and a psychologist and then trying, or, or somebody says, okay, you don't like children. That's okay. Yeah. Let's put you with adults only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay. You can be a good doctor with adults. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but no, but children don't get near children. Mm. If you definitely, this is your experience you had for whatever reason, you ended up not <coughs> liking children. Well, don't get into that. Yeah. We don't do that. We figure that out as the problems begin to occur in the practice of medicine. Mm. We don't anticipate that. We don't prevent that from happening. Mm. And so if I have somebody that goes in there because what they want to be famous, why would, you know, a lot of people go into medicine, they want to be famous. That's like their objective. They want to be famous. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they want to publish scientific papers and everything. Okay, well, that's good. Do bench research. Go into a laboratory. Do a PhD. Mm-hmm. But don't get near patients. Yeah, yeah that, that's good. That's very important what you do. Research is fundamental for everything that we do. But maybe you're not the right person to be with children. Right. And so th- those are things, again, that... that Again, we, 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 we're not clearing and we're not having a good idea of what's happening with that. And, and again, sometimes we don't even know what's happening in the minds of our students. There is a lot high rate of suicide of medical students. Mm. Medical students that are there in systems where people don't even know that they're part of the class. We had one case where nobody knew this young girl who would go in. Would be the, first, the only thing that they knew was she was the first one to go to class. Mm-hmm. And she was there all the time, the first one, sitting in the same place. Mm. And then somebody said, and then one day I noticed that she had like, like pink hair. She, she, that was not the color of her hair, but that's all I remember. Yeah. And, it was, and they, they had almost ended the year, and nobody knew who she was until she committed suicide. Mm. And so we all looked at ourselves and we said, wow. You know, we have a class of medical students that don't know each other. And we asked them to talk about this person who had died. Mm-hmm. And they couldn't remember anything about that person mm. we have a disconnect <laughs> yeah. and, and it has to do a lot with the technology mm-hmm. because we're all in our little worlds and and i'll look in medical students the first thing they flip is the computer thing and so we we all are part of this pro- problem it's new technology and it's good old technology has a good part of it and a negative part the, the double-edged sword mm-hmm. how do you use and emphasize the good part of it and how you how can you use it without losing communication what is it that we have to change in our system that's what we needed to to, the conversation needed to be about and that has to do with prevention and again we're very bad at that we we, physicians tend to go away from that because they feel that that we feel good is when we're intervening and you know using our technology and everything but not that type of issue it's a big problem yeah (coughs) well dr roas we have been at it for two hours now this has been really good (laughs) this is definitely the longest world of hustle podcast this may be the longest podcast i've done (laughs) this has been awesome um okay out of respect for your time there's two more questions can i ask you two more questions sure um and then and then we'll wrap it up um in there you mentioned the vanity Mm -hmm. and then you also mentioned um just it you, sometimes it's it's three it's three a.m. or sometimes it's you know you have to go until you're done and that sort of thing. Um, I've always been under the impression that doctors work a lot of hours. Um, and I'll ask the other question. Um, in, in addition to that, the va- going back to the vanity part, I have this impression of doctors some some that there's a little bit of. Um, uh, ego sometimes, right? Um, I just want to know um, what is, and, and look, obviously 
in my opinion, in society's opinion, doctors are very smart people. So if anybody has a right to uh, have more ego, I guess it would be doctors. But I just want to know what your what your thoughts are on those two things. Actually, I'm sorry. I have to ask you one more thing too after this before I forget. Okay. So, so with that part, um, one of the things that you would like to be able to work with people is for them to um, lower their ego. Mm -hmm. We all have ego. It's, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, the humbleness comes when you understand that even if you study the, the hardest and everything, the more you, you study, the more you learn, the less you know the more you're aware that you really don't know, right? Mm. And, and so um, that if, if we understand that we're all interdependent and to be able to be successful, for example, taking care of a patient, you need a team. Mm -hmm. And that each person of the team is valuable. And sometimes people ignore members of teams because they consider them insignificant and they do a better job than they do. And I would tell you, for example, the people, the cleaning ladies and the men that clean, mm -hmm. that work in, 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 in those services, the cleaning services in the hospitals. Without them, and the COVID has demonstrated it, without them, <laughs> nothing functions, everything stops. Yeah. Yes, uh, these people connect more with the patients. They are cleaning, but they're talking to the patients. Yeah. And many of the times, they would, if you ask the cleaning people, they will tell you things that nobody knows about the patients, that the patients have spoken to them that can help you help the patient gotcha but our, our work should be team the ego tends to bring you to become an individualist and to overemphasize your capabilities and that is dangerous mm. that's where the danger lies mm. but we tend to give medals and trophies to that type of personality mm. right and, and, and I think, now from, from my experience, I said, no, that's all the contrary. That's, that's your alarm here. That, 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 that should alarm you. Because, again, you need to be able to communicate well and have a respectful relationship with the nurses, yeah. with the cleaning people, with the physical therapist, with the occupational therapist, with the nutritionist, with the pharmacist, you know, with the people from the administration. All these, it's a team of people. And so you, you, if, if, you, if you have more ego, then you are going to have more mortality rate. And I'll give you one example. With that one, it will be clear. Mm -hmm. So we had in an emergency a man that came in who had been hit by a car while he was changing the tire. And the car ran over him mm -hmm. and fractured all the pelvis. Mm -hmm. And they brought him in with his six-year-old who was in the car. And the child was good. Nothing was wrong with the child. And the surgeon that was with me was one of those experienced, mature persons, down to earth, very calm. And he said, Mario, we can't go into surgery with this person. And I asked him, why? He says, yes, look at the fractured pelvis. And then he showed the, the x-ray was fractured into all these pieces yeah. he goes precisely because right now it's contained there is like 500 cc's of blood contained around that membrane that covers the pelvis yeah if you go in there and try to explore that that patient is going to die in seconds yeah so this was at seven in the morning so we had to change shift yeah and there came a younger doctor, yeah. very cocky, very loud spoken, and this experienced physician, much older than he, mm -hmm. explained to him the situation and gave his recommendation. Yeah. And the younger physician disagreed. He says, take the patient to surgery, but we already had given the patient so he had the direction of what was going to happen. Yeah. As soon as he said that, and he walked off that, to prepare the surgical room. Mm -hmm. The my attending said, "Mario, I know we should be going home, but we have to stay here mm -hmm. because this is going to be a disaster. 
and we need to see if we can contain it. The surgeon went in and lo and behold, 10 minutes into starting that procedure, they called, uh, called him in. I, I, was, mm -hmm. I was the medical student at that time and I, <laughs> to run in, I was the intern, mm -hmm. the surgical intern at that time. And uh, we ran in and you can imagine that person. That surgeon was almost crying. Mm -hmm. He couldn't stop the bleeding. I mean, while we just walked in, all the vital signs of the patient went out. Yeah. They asked me to go tell the six-year-old that his father had died after seeing that. Yeah. And I was, I, I couldn't sleep that night. I couldn't, you know, they were saying, this was absolutely preventable. Yeah. But ego, I learned with time. I understood it intuitively. Yeah. But not being able to understand it. Oh, this is ego. I know there was something cocky about that person, but later I understand it's human nature. It's the individual individualist that feels that they can do everything and that they they have control of everything. They don't work as a team. They don't pay attention to mm. other people who are more experienced than them. And he made a decision. What was his decision? It cost the life of that father. Yeah. And now not only is a dead father, but there was a child who did not have a father. Yeah. And I had to tell that child and that child was crying. I mean, that was a disastrous change of shift. Yeah. And so I, 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 I learned that if, if you have ego, if, if you really know yourself and you, you recognize that you have it, you need to work on bringing it down. Yeah. But that's not what we teach in medical school. We like the big egos yeah you know we like the surgeon that says no this is these are the hands that operated that person and that's why that's a lucky person you know it's the ego that makes everybody mm -hmm. you know, move with it's human nature but that's again you have to educate so that that's not the case you're not there to, to prove that you're wonderful and famous and because it leads to a very you know there are there are five obscurations in, in human beings and, and one of those well, is, well, it's, it, it's, it's desire or lust. And it could be lust for sex or power, money, whatever. Mm -hmm. The other is anger, real anger. Uh, the other part is, is um, uh, vanity. See? Mm -hmm. we, uh, why? Because that ego, it's, it represents a very large ego and it, and it produces suffering. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that answers that part of the question. I, I, Absolutely. And, and the other part was? The other was just the work-life balance. Like, okay. Yeah. And so the doctors are victims right now of the system mm -hmm. because we live in, in, a, in, in a system where health is a, is a commodity. You have, if you have good money, you buy you know, a better commodity. If you don't have as much money, you get worse commodity. Here in the United States, we tend to give everybody, but then it, it, we don't say, I'm talking about in, in, in globally in developing countries, it's like that. Yeah. That the, the more money you have, the more quality of service, like I mentioned to you in, in that public hospital, you don't have resources, less, less quality and higher mortality. In the United States, you take care of everybody equally, and that's the very good thing. So, but people come out with debts that are humongous and we don't see the effects of that how that affects society as mm -hmm. a, as a whole but because the objective of the com of the insurance companies is that they bet they bet everything on the lowest risk population and so they don't want to bring in people who already have preconditions right if, if you have diabetes i don't want to hear about you because <laughs> you're going to have heart disease you're going to have vascular disease you're going to you know, your, your sugar levels are, you know, you, you're going to have diabetic problems and uh, surgical intervention. So they, they don't want you as a patient. They want the people who are, their hope is to get the majority of the patients in that bracket where they're like 15 to 44, 45, where they're healthier. And then they bet mostly on that population. And they try to find ways to exclude people who have already the diseases. That's the problem of our system. Yeah. And so it's not a system that's all inclusive. That uh, first preventive, so you don't get to those levels, 
but then be all inclusive. That's what we really need in the United States and globally. That's what we need, not yeah. just for the United States. That's the way it should be, that where the predominant is preventive medicine. And then you have high quality like here you have in the United States, but everybody has access to high quality care. Mm -hmm. Something like Canada, but making it more efficient with the preventive component of this. Uh, so you don't overflow just the disease part. Uh, so you decrease the amount of sick people, but then you give better quality to them. And you give doctors more time to be able to take care and think about their patients. Right now, I need to see you in 10 minutes. And then I have, you know, another 18 patients waiting for me, 19 patients waiting for me to see them at 10 minutes each. Yeah. That's not the way you treat people. It's, 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 it's a... It's a factory. It's a chain. <laughs> and so you miss things. My, my wife once took my son, who was like two months old, a very good friend of mine, and he's my buddy and everything. But it, he was so stressed because the nurse was saying that there's all these people waiting outside. You got 10 minutes, and she would hand him the papers. So he would write, what's the wrong? And she came in, sat there. And he gave the formula and everything, got up, went to the with bed uh, examined my uh, my son i wasn't there she told me the story <laughs> and then she he write the prescription he walked out he had been in our house uh having dinner like the week before but he knew my wife but he didn't look at her and he didn't recognize who it was wow and it's not his fault yeah and and so doctors are really uh, under a lot of stress yeah you say i'm going to study i'm going to do nephrology and, and nephrology seems to be something, and it's not acute. Yeah, you, they have some patients in intensive care, but usually very complicated end-stage renal disease. But in general, they, they, they're basically outpatient doctors. But in our hospitals, they only have one or two of them. So they have to see all of them. And you would come out, I would leave the hospitals at, at 10 o'clock, 11, 2 in the morning, mm -hmm. because of the type of work that I do with babies that are born at all these different times. And they would still be working there. <laughs> I would say, you're like the latest person. You should be like the first one now. They go, no, it's just two of us. So we have to see all these hundreds of patients. Mm. So you're you're basically exhausting these people. Yeah. The system is exhausting them. Yeah. And so that's why people are retiring earlier and they, they, they're burning out. Yeah. It's the system that's burning them out. It's not good for patient care. And, and, and this is not a factory of taking care of patients. Yeah. They need more time with their patients. They also need time with their families, their human beings. And so it's, it's, it's a system that's overwhelming. It's making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Somebody's making all that money and making money, but it's not really helping the physicians. It's not helping the patients at the end of the day uh, because physicians will make more mistakes when they're exhausted. Yeah, how uh, the risk of making mistakes, and once you make a mistake, the, s the system doesn't forgive you, mm. because then you're going to get a lawsuit, and that lawsuit is going to be, you know, the, <laughs> they said, "Don't worry, you just have one million dollars. <laughs> We're going to cover the other million, but you have a million in debt now, or like, tw like the now it's twenty million. Oh, yeah, we can only cover two million, but you got debt for eighteen million. <laughs> so, so these doctors like they have like. Uh, the, the, the sword on their neck mm -hmm. waiting to see when it's going to come down and mm -hmm. I say wow that's mm -hmm. a terrible way to practice medicine we have it wrong we don't we're not doing it right basically is what I'm saying yeah for all those who are hearing me and don't like it tough it's the reality <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm telling you I went into medicine at the age of 18 yeah I'm 66 so and I've seen it in developing countries and in developed countries so I know medicine on both sides yeah. So what I'm telling you is, 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 is what's the reality of these things. And my colleagues would agree all with me on, on that. Yeah. Um, and a nurse is not, not, not valued. These women are, and, and the men nurses that are there working next to the bedsides with their patients. Wow, these people work tremendously. And I don't think that people really, not, now they call us heroes. It's, 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 it's not about being a hero. It's about doing what you're supposed to do right. It's, 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 it's your responsibility. Yeah. I don't think that building a bridge is a great responsibility. Because what if that bridge falls down? 
what's your ethical concerns with that so for an engineer <laughs> right. there are all these things that we do have an ethical responsibility to do them right yeah. and what people should be doing whatever they're doing they should be doing it right hmm. and, and in medicine the same thing but we're not there for the fame we're not there you know to say that i'm the one that's mostly published it's not it's it's not the number of research papers. It's the quality of the research that you've done. Now, people look at the numbers. I have 250 papers. Well, Einstein had one paper, Theory of Relativity, and they said that was not good enough at that time. At, I think it was the University of Zurich. They said, just do something else. Write something else. And he comes with the Theory of Relativity with, with the quantum physics theory. Mm -hmm. He goes, okay, we'll take you in as an instructor. I mean, these people didn't know what was going on. It went over their heads. They didn't know what, what this man was talking about. Yeah. yeah? And, and so does he need 200 papers? No, he just needed those. <laughs> then he did something with magnets and he, to get his, his whatever yeah. uh, the award he got. But, but that's not, it's not about the quantity. We're, we're very fixed on numbers. You know, it's ratings and things like that. And who appears in the magazines and that stuff. It's not about that. It's about patience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Okay. As I promised, one last question. Okay. Um, and I asked this because, um, so if you don't know, I work in corporate finance. Mm -hmm. um, and within that space, it is challenging. Um, I was just speaking to a colleague recently that's a minority um, and it's it's been challenging um, for many people um, within corporate finance that are minorities, their path in, in that career. Within the U.S., you are a minority. I want to know how that has uh, impacted you within um, your journey as a medical professional. Uh, because I'm of a Hispanic descent, yes, of Colombian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's been very interesting. I think. Look, if if you told me if I if you asked me what is the situation of a working person in Colombia versus um, a person from the United States, I give them this example. It's a very simple one because I I lived it. Mm -hmm. In in, in Colombia, when if you're doing very 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 well, if you're very dedicated and you're you know, you're, you're studying, you're, do, you're responsible, you come on time, you do your work and everything you're doing. People get nervous. And the, what goes into their mind is the ego, the individual. Mm -hmm. And so they say, oh, that person's going to take my job away. Mm -hmm. And then they start doing everything so that you fall. Yeah. People start to undermine you. Right. Because they're afraid. Right. And yeah. they'll, they'll make a hole so that you fall in that hole. Yeah. That's, that's the culture. That's that has that, that how that come that there's a historical mm -hmm. cause for that, but that's predominant. Yeah, you take that same person in the United States, and the people are observing that person that comes in on time, does his work, you know, goes the extra mile to do things, and is creative, whatever. And everybody's saying, "Hmm, I want that person on my team." Mm. And so, here, that's the success. People want to create teams with the best people. Yeah. yeah. And so if you do what you're supposed to do, mm -hmm. the system lifts you up. And that's my system. That's how I've done everything that I've been able to do here. Yeah. And I can't say that I, oh, I did this on my own. I went to Yale on my own. No, 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 no. I didn't. It was people observing me mm -hmm. with that mindset, that yeah. attitude. They want to create teams and they want people who they believe have potential and are good to be on their team. Yeah, That's why they gave me my first job at the University of Miami, and then the rest just moves on like that. Yeah. While I was in Columbia, <laughs> it wasn't like that. Yeah. That I was, I was the, the holes everywhere. I was falling into holes. I was not getting anywhere. Yeah. And um, people I, were sabotaging you. They were sabotaging, of course. You wow. know, I, I give you an example, simple example. When I went, I had done my residency, and I learned about. How when you go to it, when there's a delivery problem, you go into the delivery room, you put on your surgical gown and you set up everything. And as soon as the baby's there, you start doing all your interventions to support the baby. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything different. I went to this institution and I started to do that. 
And I had been doing that for a month when they called me and they said, you have to stop doing that. And you go, why? Because the pediatricians are all upset because you're doing that. You know, resuscitating, uh, you know, doing all the support, life support for the baby in the delivery room when he's being born sick in the C-section, mm -hmm. doing it right there. Yes, they don't want you to do that. No, but that's the right thing to do. That's where you're supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. No, these pedi the pediatricians in that hospital, <laughs> basically when that happened, they would take with the baby that came out bad and they would give it to a nurse and the nurse would run out of the hall through all the surgical ward to the end, other end and then pass the baby through a little window to another nurse that grabbed the baby and ran to where that pediatrician was with his tie and his, uh, you know, his white gown and everything waiting for the baby to intervene. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so... Yeah. They wanted me out because I said, I, I'm not going to do that. Gotcha. If they call me in and it's an emergency delivery mm -hmm. and that's it's surgical and they're doing a C-section, mm -hmm. you have to go in, change like the surgeons, get in there, prepare everything, all your tools and everything. And I'm talking this, I'm talking, this is uh, 1986. Mm-hmm. 19, in between 1986 and 1987. That's how, in that hospital, that's how it was. And so those pediatricians at the end asked that I be thrown out of my job, basically. The, 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 the director of the hospital didn't have any reasons. He told me, I don't have a specific reason to throw you out because you're doing your job, but all the pediatricians here want you out. And so I'm going to transfer you to an outpatient <laughs> clinic. <laughs> and I, mm. I said... And that's what they did. They transferred me. They punished me. They put me in an outpatient clinic far away from the hospital. Yeah. I was not doing hospital work. So mm -hmm. I had to work because my, my child was like a, a month old. So I, I couldn't just say I'm not, I quit. I had to wait a year. To, oh, I found another job to leave that place. Mm -hmm. But that's the type of thing that happened to me there. It's not, nothing like as soon as I came here, it was just being there somebody observing me during those three months that I was an observer at that unit in, at the University of Miami at Jackson Memorial. And that Dr. Bancari, who was the director of that unit, he was the first one. He said, I got a job for you. You want the job? I have it right now for you. Yeah. I said, I want the job. <laughs> and that, I mean, he, he was observing. It's yeah. the culture, different culture. Yeah. So, so there, there is a, a big difference. So going back to the question again, mm -hmm. um, what was, was it the, the question? Well, the question, I was just trying to see how um, being a minority in the U.S. Okay. had impacted you. So, so I could tell you that for me, mm -hmm. not at all. Not at all, okay. Not at all. Yeah. That I've been in situations uh, uh, have exposed to discrimination, absolutely. Yeah. But sometimes it wasn't even by American, it was by other people. Yeah. Like I had one time that... Uh, uh, I, they heard that I, I was from Colombia and somebody asked me, uh, that means that you have to wipe that white powder that you have on your shoulder? And th that type of joke. Mm. So I, I knew that we were alluding to, yeah. to cocaine. So yeah, uh, yeah th those things mm -hmm. happened, but those things weren't really important to me because they didn't really... I knew that they didn't understand the problem because yeah. this is a, that's another very complicated problem. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so... It's, it's very clear when somebody doesn't really understand that what's happening with that. But uh, other than that, I can't say absolutely anything. All I had was people always looking at me as how I did my work, observing and saying, I want that person to be part of my team. And that's why mm -hmm. I was able to be part of Vanderbilt and mm -hmm. University of North Carolina and Wake Forest and, 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 and you know, ended up also doing my postgraduate training at, at Yale because of that, all th that that simple thing yeah. uh, that makes America what it is. That's why people want to come here. Yeah. Many of them because they're just tired of being abused in other places. Yeah. Uh, and they see that if they come here, they're, they're going to be valued because they're hardworking people. Yeah. Uh, th that's, and, and if you look at that, that's the history of America. Yeah. That's what makes it so strong. Mm -hmm. It's that people that come to really work hard and do their thing and, and, and they're part of, they make society better because they do... They, they, you know, they're really honest, hardworking people. And because they're such a strong middle class, mm -hmm. 
which is how I measure how well a country is. Infant mortality, maternal mortality, and what's the proportion of middle class? I take those three and I know, okay. This you know country, everything you need to know. Yeah, this country's in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> know this country's it's getting, it's, it's moving in that direction. Yeah. Or this country was here and now it's moving in the opposite direction. Things, something's going wrong. Yeah. But those are basic the metrics, but that's, that's how it's been in the United States. It's been wonderful. It's yeah. been great. Awesome. Um, well, this has been, a, this has been awesome, Dr. Rojas. I really appreciate it. Oh, I've had, I've had an absolute blast. Um, we, this has been we, two and a half hours and I'm telling you, I could, I could cons- sit here and continue to probe you. Um, and hopefully we can have more conversations. In the future. I, I really appreciate it. No, a pleasure, Ryan. Thank you very much. Thank you.